program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. The vibrant colours of the lilac breasted roller are really beautiful in the winter sun and this is Safari Live. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Safari Live and what a great start. We've got this beautiful lilac breasted roller that's perched up in the top of this tree, posing really nicely for us and as I said in this winter sun those colours are very very vibrant and just wonderful to see. Lovely little start. Uh, my name is Byron and on camera with me is Sebastian this afternoon. And um, then you would have seen that Taylor's on the other vehicle this afternoon, so not an all-boys safari. Um, Taylor and Craig are on the other vehicle, and I believe that we might have the Mara joining us a little bit later, hopefully. Hopefully. They were experiencing some rain, though. So, um, we, but we'll see. Maybe they are still able to get out. And then don't forget, we are completely live, everyone. So send us your questions and your comments at hashtag safari live. That is how you get hold of us. And we'll gladly answer them for you. Now, it was an exciting morning. There was lions, a lot of lion activity. And there was a lot of hyena around last night too. So we're going to see what we can find this afternoon. Unfortunately, the two males that we had this morning crossed out of the property south of us onto Little Gauri. But you never know, they may still appear a little bit later. Um, so we'll listen out for them. It's still really warm. It's a beautiful winter's day. So I don't think they'll be too active just yet. Most of the predators are most likely still resting in the shade somewhere. Now uh, we're just driving around seeing what we can find. Who knows, maybe some elephant or buffalo. Ali, you say you're hoping for more cats today. Well, we'll try our best, we'll try our best, always. Um, I would like to find a leopard. So Ali, I'm going to try my best and see if we can see a leopard this afternoon. Now, we're going to be driving along the um, northern boundary a little bit. That's our plan for now. See if there are any fresh tracks of leopards coming in and out of the property. While we do that, let's cross over to Taylor, who would like to say good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again to Safari Live. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Craig. Now, remember... Live and interactive, of course, is what we do. So hashtag Safari Live with any of your questions. Now we're bumbling about. We've just passed Treehouse Dam, and sadly, my family of warthogs that were in the water ran away. Not great. So just a, a tip to all of you. Seen as I'm driving with ooh, Byron is on the other car, and he always does a tip of the day. Shouting "Sui" does not call in the warthogs like it may with domestic pigs. So don't try that. Just wanted to confirm that to all of you now of course if you were watching the pre-drive you'll know that my plan is to try and find shadow so no fresh tracks at all around twin dams so we're just driving on the southern road now towards weaver's nest we will quickly check i haven't decided if we're going to go all the way towards treehouse dam or then we'll go back west up gary mania oh, i'm tossing and turning but we'll see what uh, tracks we find if we find any on Weaver's Nest and then we'll make our decision from there. We'll probably have to ask Butternut Craig for his help. <laughs> I told you and Craig I'm gonna just keep saying it until it sticks and it catches on Butternut Craig. But yes it's been a very adventurous day in camp today. We've had all sorts of laughs and things. You'll have to ask Byron to tell you the story about the what did he call it? The onesie bikini. Yes. A onesie bikini is what Byron calls a normal one-piece swim swimsuit costume, normal swimming costume. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's never seen one before. 
But anyway, we're having good chuckles at that, so you'll have to ask him to explain himself about that. He'll probably laugh like a giggling Gertie for the rest of the afternoon. Yay! That's zebra crossing! Ah oh, ha ha ha! Haven't heard that joke for a while. Hey Craig, I bet the last time you laughed that hard you fell off your dinosaur. Right, here are the stripy horses that we've got out here in the bush. I think they've actually been resting here because I can see some patches on the sand where I think that they've been laying down. And, Craig, if I move forward for you, you might actually see one rolling, but I've parked in the absolute worst position. I'm sorry for this. I will be better. There's one. Having a little rest. So zebras like to have siestas too. Just like horses. My horse used to have siestas strategically. And he used to do it just... Uh, Psyche knew when I was going to have a horse riding lesson, he'd decide, no, he'd be sleeping then. I always felt so terrible. <laughs> Then I just get the food bucket and shake that and he well gallop over like he wasn't doing anything else before. This is a youngster, it's not a particularly old zebra, I'm not as old as the others in here. Well, probably almost two years old now. And that must be mom going over to be comforted. <laughs> that, now listen, Craig, that is revolting. Did you hear Craig? <laughs> it wasn't, it was the zebra. <laughs> having a roll around now sadly actually not sadly because it does provide quite a bit of a sort of humor out in the bush is the simple digestive system of a zebra often produces quite a bit of uh, well gas and zebra are known for the flatulence <laughs> it's so funny anyways this looks like the stallion isn't he beautiful he actually looks like an older boy He's got tattered ears, probably from fighting. He's got a couple of scars on his body too, all old battle wounds. Now, Riti, you're wondering if this is a part of the McCurdy herd? You know what? Sadly, I don't know. I've lost track of the McCurdy herd. McCurdy herd, you haven't seen them for such a long time. Unfortunately, the Nkohumas, I think, tucked into a few of them, which is very upsetting. But these guys, maybe it is, because they're very relaxed, even around the cars. Maybe you can pull up some old screenshots and maybe one of them has got a very distinct feature that we can sort of tell. Oh, right, let's go across to Byron very quickly for his antelope. And we have got a beautiful little antelope here, the small Stirnbok. And this is the male. The female was here. She just moved off quite quickly. She's a little shy and but the male you see look look how, that's very interesting you see he dropped his his drop dung there you see how he's scraping the dirt over it now now Stenbach have been known to do this um he may even urinate i can't really see now he may urinate but um sometimes what happens is the Stenbach will try cover their dung um and their urine so sometimes they do it to try and you know they're very secretive little antelope so they'll do that so perhaps the predators don't pick up on their scent so they'll scrape uh, they'll scrape sand over the dung and urine but also um, sometimes if the male stenbok can be quite territorial they'll scratch open sections of dirt and urinate so the urine lands on the fresh dirt and it may keep the scent for a little bit longer but over here I think he was just actually covering his dirt and then he goes off he goes very very quick agile little antelope very secretive and they generally are found in pairs male and female and they do tend to stay together for life unless obviously one is is um, caught by a predator but a wonderful wonderful view of that male and interesting behavior to see them covering their dung Phil you say it's such a pretty little one it is beautiful little antelope and very small the smallest antelope we have in this area they are very beautiful I do enjoy seeing the stenbok and this one this one's been very um, very kind and cooperative to stand still and let us view him like this because often they'll run off quite quickly like the female did but this one's just moving in the same direction as that female He's quite curious, keeps turning and watching us. But you see how alert they are. Look at those ears constantly moving around. And they'll put their heads down, feed, and then lift their heads up again to look around if there's potentially any danger. Let's see if he does it again. 
quickly there we go head up Lorena you say has got such a tiny tail they do they don't have very long tails small antelope I suppose doesn't need a big long tail but you see that head constantly looking around for any potential danger and also what the stenbok do occasionally is they'll lie dead still in a grassy area and if a predator does get too close they'll jump up and dart off in one direction away from the predator and it usually happens so quickly it catches the predator by surprise and then they're not able to hunt them but as I said they're very fast and very alert little antelope really really nice to see and just that beautiful contrast with the burnt area and the, and the brown dry grass this is a, a fire break, this section that uh, that we're driving past at the moment. Right, well, that was that was a nice surprise, wasn't it? Now we caught a glimpse. Sebastian caught a glimpse of some warthog to our left. Just going to see if they're still there. Hold on, just need to reverse a little bit. Uh, let me know if you see them, Sebastian. Where did they go? Uh, probably moved off already. Sometimes the warthogs can be shy. Just having a look. I think they've moved on. Oh uh, well, we'll see if we can find some more warthog. Taylor's still got those zebra. She seems to be having a lot of luck with the zebra at the moment. Let's go have a look. Just the McCurdy Hurdy, which is making me think that this perhaps are my long lost family. But who knows? They're very obliging, which is quite nice. I mean, they have barely moved. They're now standing in the road. Like I said, they're so relaxed with us, which is really fantastic because we don't often get to sit with very relaxed zebra. They always panic and run off. And it's one of the most sought after animals to see out in the bush. And you can clearly see why with their beautiful patterns. You wouldn't really think out here in the middle of Africa you'd find something that was white and black but strangely enough it works but you can see the flies are also out and about today the stallion's not particularly happy they seem to be biting him quite a bit on the back of his legs and he's definitely an older boy we we're talking about his tattered ears and all the scars that he has on it also looks like his his sort of hind fetlocks um, so Crowy Craig that's just above the foot the hoof they're quite swollen, which I, I suppose is another sign of his age. I always see that with horses as they start to get old. Their fetlocks always, always look a little bit on the swollen side. Well, typically, and that's where they're biting him. All the tails are wagging today, though. I'm sure they'll be appreciating the nice breeze that's just starting to pick up. You can slowly start to see the trees sort of moving. You might even be able to hear a woodpecker in the distance, too. very peaceful out here. There's actually not much going on at all in terms of sounds this afternoon. Just that one woodpecker and I'm not sure which woodpecker it is unfortunately it's behind some leaves so we can't identify it from here. But normally you hear the turtle doves or the odd starling. Perhaps it's a little bit on the warm side and everyone's just hiding away in the shade. I'm hoping we get some good bird sightings. It's a pity that there's no ox peckers here. Let's move up a little bit further forward and have a look at these two zebra on the right here. Don't want to nudge you off the road. I just want to go a little bit further forward. Sorry, zebra. There we go. I wanted to have a look at these two now. So there's one, two, I just want to also count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zebra from what I can see. I think the original McCurdy Hurdy was nine and then there was another group I think that pushed their numbers up to about 13 or some, somewhere around there if I, if I can remember correctly but I do stand at a correction. You can hashtag Safari Live if you remember exactly how many McCurdy Hurdy members there are. Perhaps you'd like to share some pictures of the old herd. It'd be nice. Now, Jackie, you're wondering if these are male zebras. No, not all of them. The one that we're looking at at the moment that's just putting her head on the back of her, her previous offspring, that's a mare. 
and she looks like she's in foal at the moment and I can't tell uh, it looks like a female too her daughter isn't that great that's a perfect screenshot there so here it's just a great demonstration of how zebra are actually very social creatures just like horses are constantly grooming one another and the bond is particularly strong between mother and daughter it's also very strong between the stallion and his favorite mare he will spend a lot of time grooming her but this youngster will probably stay in the herd for the rest of her life just shaking her head obviously some flies or something bothering her in her ear but they will spend lots of time together this is so pretty Now, Ashraf, you said beautiful zebra. They are indeed, they are one of nature's prettiest things. Though there's very few things out in nature, in my opinion, that are not necessarily, well, I suppose, nice to the eye. Some may disagree and say hyenas and crocodiles, but I think they've, they're beautiful in their own kind of way. But zebras in particular, everybody takes fondly to them, especially with those spiky manes and those long tails. So not all zebras actually have long tails, especially if you're a stallion. I've actually seen lots of stallions without tails, and I suppose when, you, when you're fighting, you, uh, you can lose that tail quite quickly, and that would be an unfortunate thing to lose as an animal out here. Imagine not being able to swat those biting flies, and they really do bite. Now, also lots of horse flies and things out here too. That's a real problem, and anybody that's ever been bitten by a horse fly will know the pain that it brings. It's not particularly pleasant at all. Now if we're starting off this wonderfully this afternoon, I wonder what else lies ahead. I wonder, Craig, maybe we should go towards Twin Dams. I think we need to go and have a look around a watering hole. We'll go up and let's try and sneak past the stallion. Let's see if he's friendly. Bye Zebbies, maybe see you later. They might go to Treehouse Dam for a drink so we can always come back around here. Anyways, we'll keep carrying on and hopefully I'll be able to find you some elephants or some other animals to have a look at. I'm going to send you across to Byron, who's got a water buck. We have indeed, Taylor, good luck with your search for animals, but we found some more antelope. And it's larger than the Steenbok, obviously, the beautiful water buck. Now some females that are lying out in the burnt areas, in the open burnt areas. And we were chatting about it the other day, and um, a lot of antelope species enjoy these burnt areas at the moment because they do get a lot of nutrients from certain plants and that that might be um, growing already, perhaps just uh, coming through this burnt section, but I think the animals also pick up on other nutrients from the, the soil and that after these fires. Nice to see the water back. Very prominent white stripe on the rump. You can see even with that one lying down, you can still see it. Very shaggy coats. Long, hairy, shaggy coats. You see that one is chewing the cud at the moment. You see how that jaw is moving and chewing? And chewing the cud, of course, because it is a ruminant. So it's got that four-chambered stomach. And what happens is they'll be, they'll be um, feeding on vegetation they swallow it it goes into the first chamber of the stomach they regurgitate and then they rechew the food and it breaks it down even more mixed with those enzymes from the stomach and then they swallow it again and it breaks down the food even further so very efficient digestive system for the ruminants and that's why these water buck are busy chewing the cut at the moment that one's not now Francis you say they're fluffy Francis all the way from Israel <laughs> they are quite fluffy, I suppose. A beautiful light on that, just that uh, side light, I suppose you could say, with that, that hair is being caught beautifully in the sunlight. Notice also they're just facing different directions. And even though they are out in the open, um, they're still very, very alert and aware of what's going on around them. <laughs> Laurie, you say they've got a bullseye on their bottom. <laughs> I suppose it's one way of looking at it. <laughs> 
Now the theory behind that white marking, like with most um, antelope, and they've got some form of marking on the rump, and the theory behind it is that it's a following mechanism perhaps, if they are um, in danger, they'd run away and they'd follow, they'd be able to see where, where the other antelope are running and try to stick together as a group and get away from the predators as quickly as possible. So that's a theory. I don't know if it's really been proven or not, but um, it does, I suppose, make sense. Here's some branches moving. I might be imagining things. I heard some branches moving. Just going to listen for a second. Let's just try here. <laughs> you know what it is. It's these his water buck urinating and the the sound is actually it's quite loud that, that was amazing and the, the urine falling on the dry and dead leaves and the grass over there and that's what it was that's amazing it was actually quite loud it sounded like something moving through through some dry branches notice how these female Waterbuck didn't cover the urine or, or the dung like the little stenbok did. So it's interesting to see how the different antelope have different behavior. Depending on the size, um, are they in bigger groups, are they solitary? Those stenbok are generally, not quite solitary, but they're generally in pairs. They're not in large groups, whereas the waterbuck in much larger groups, um, not like the impala, but small family groups, like here we've just got the three. Sometimes you can get um, up to 10 or 12, maybe even more. Again, that light just catching that very shaggy coat of the water back. Riti, the, the waterbuck, so the theory behind waterbuck and why they're called, let me just turn this way rather, how's it? <laughs> so Riti, why they're called waterbuck, the theory is that because they're constantly found um, near water and they're one of the antelope that are actually quite reliant on water. So they need to drink fairly regularly and that's why they're constantly found near water and that's where the name waterbuck comes from. So Riti, that's the theory again. Yeah, you know, I always say it's a theory because I don't know how how many of these, um, the not quite stories, but uh, explanations have been proven. But it's what's been written in the past and what people have observed. But with the waterbuck, that is something that uh, we think is why they've been given the name waterbuck. Um, but like I say, sometimes the stories do vary. Uh, it all depends on the area or where you are. Maybe some people have heard something else been made up um, but I think the, the the main reason is because they are very reliant on water back I've read that they can suffer from dehydration if they don't get water so that's why they do need to stay close to the water all right I think we actually going to head down to the water now we're gonna head towards Biffleshook Dam and see if there's anything near there I'm casting all the way from Denmark. You asked if these waterbuck have these shaggy coats or long coats all year round, um, or do they shed them? So animals generally do form thicker coats, somewhat thicker coats in the winter, but the waterbuck always have the shaggy coat. They always look like they've got long, thicker coats, much longer coats than any of the other antelope that we have in the area. So they do have them all year round. But it probably thins out slightly in the summer, but they do have it all year round. I really hope we find something at Biffles Hook Dam. The last, uh, for quite some time now, every time I head over here, we haven't really had much luck. 
but um, but maybe we we find something around here now we're not too far but while I head there it looks like Taylor's found something you can go and have a look for yourself it's a tree <laughs> up there I'm pointing I'm pointing at a crested bar but Craig up there there so you see where the you can see the branch and it goes up it, like here, in here. Also, there. Maybe that way. And go a little bit. See, there we go. The, he's just jumping up. The branches are moving. We're trying to find the crested bar, but there's so many birds in this jackalberry. You can see there's definitely something in there. There, you got it, Craig. And they're eating the fruit. And we had something quite funny happen to us, but I'm not going to tell you about it just yet because I want to find the culprit that was involved in this situation with Craig and I. A very bouncy crested barb. It's just landed in the next set of leaves. We'll have to wait for it to move again before we can spot it. Oh, I can sort of see it. You're, you're going into the right place. Uh, just hopped again. You're very hoppy. Maybe it's confused, this bird. But as you can imagine, there's going to be lots and lots of birds around here. Uh, can you see it again? It's just hopped. It's actually sitting a little bit out in the open. There we go. Yeah, just drop a little bit down. A little bit more yeah it's right low down now it's very difficult to see unfortunately with the small monitors that they've got on the cameras itself so it's not always easy but there you can see all the jackalberry fruits and <laughs> the crested barber just keeps darting through the screen it's actually quite impressive as to how invisible this bird is even with its bright colors now it's sitting on the open stick there Craig it's probably going to move though can you see it Maybe if you find it with your eyes first. There, you've got it right in the middle. I think it was there. Oh, it is there. It's just behind. Uh, it's in the shadow of the leaves. That's what's making it so difficult. Now, I'm actually trying to find the African green pigeon. Let me see if I can find the African green pigeon because that one doesn't move as quickly as the barbet does. Barbet, please point out the African green pigeon to me. Maybe I'll try and call it. Very poor example of an African green pigeon call. Now the barbet's sitting nicely, Craig. Sitting beautifully, feeding on some fruit. You see it? Just in the middle here. So there's this clump of trees in the middle, right at the top of this like, little shrubbery. It's just flown. No, you can't see it. Okay, never mind. Birding is not going to work this afternoon. Right, let me tell you my funny story then. Anyways, I was standing at the base of the jackalberry tree and I looked up at this African green pigeon. And I said, please could you drop me one? Uh, as a joke, obviously, because the bird can't speak English. Anyway, it did. It dropped me this. But a half-eaten one. And you can have a nice close look at it so you can actually see what, it's, what it looks like. But I was a bit sad by that. I thought I was at least going to get a fruit that it hadn't tucked into. Now I can't eat it. I don't really want to eat something that the bird has been feeding on. But it's not ripe yet. I mean, it's not yellow, but here are the seeds. Let me break it open. Let me make a mess on the dashboard. Get sticky fingers and we'll have to get the wet wipes out. Mmm, look how nice that is. You can have a look at that so long. Isn't that cool? So those are all the seeds. That you often see the barbets and things sort of regurgitating. They won't digest those. They'll spit those back up. But there isn't much flesh on the on the fruits. They are, like I said, they're not quite ripe yet. They should go lovely golden yellow. And then they're a lot softer. And there's a little bit of little bit of fruit. But not much. Okay, now we need to get rid of it. Oh, there's the pigeon, Craig. I can see it bouncing. Can you see it just through there? Right on the other side. Did you say no? Um, but then look for it with your eyes first. So, well, where did it go? So you see this very low branch, the main branch of the tree that goes to the left. You have to be able to see that. Then there's some branches that are just creeping up just above it. And you sort of follow them up and then you might see the African green pigeon hanging upside down. It's sort of, if you put your arm out straight next to you, it'll be there. Okay, can you, can you zoom in for me? To the left, that's the main branch on the left. Left, 
other left, yes, and then go up. Okay, Craig it is. I can see it with my eyes, it's here somewhere. And then you see if that's it? Or where we have to go. We're looking for oh there it is. Craig, it's right there, it's hanging on the branch, it's in the shade. Is the African green pigeon. That's very difficult to see because it's hanging upside down at the moment, but that's it there. They're very good at dangling upside down, don't you think? They're quite nimble for something like a pigeon, which is typically painted to be something that eats lots of seeds and bread at the park and doesn't look like the most athletic bird. But they are, they're very, very good at dangling upside down. Now, you might hear some strange noises. I'm getting a wet wipe out to wipe my hands because they're very sticky now. And I also need to wipe where I've just put that fruit so the ants don't come. We don't want ants. We've got enough spiders in this car. We don't want to encourage the spiders to stay here. But um, amazing, these birds. And I can't believe there are not more of them. We just seem to be you see the odd crested barbet here. Perhaps it's because a lot of the other jackalberry trees must be fruiting now too. So there's not a lot of competition going around at the moment. They can sort of spread out. Okay, um, first thing in the morning, this must be a good tree to come to. We'll have to check it out at some point and see if we find lots of birds roosting in here. This was the area where the hardy dar ibises actually had a nest too, so it's definitely a well-used tree, but I don't see anything at the moment constructing a nest. There's lots of little holes. We're talking about birds that nest in tree cavities and all the crested barbets who are actually telling about them too. They're definitely one of them, so they could be using this. I'm sure there's squirrels up in here. It's actually very quiet. I'm disappointed. I thought we were going to come to Tree Hut and Tree House Dam and Tree House Dam and Twin Dams and there was going to be lots and lots of things, but it seems as though I'm incorrect. Now, I did see some elephant tracks too, but unfortunately they go out. They just came for a drink and then they disappear again. Very sneaky, those elephants. Okay, let's carry on. I think we might dip down into the Mulwati. I think that's going to be our next choice I want to just do a bit of checking around here maybe we'll go up towards Inyala Road and then maybe Central and down Cheetah Cut Line and go that way while we do that Byron has arrived at Bivels Hook Dam and he's got some hippos splashing about so we have indeed we've got some hippo quite splashing around um, but <laughs> this hippo was covered in bird dung. Um, some ox peckers had been sitting on this hippo and they were both basking just uh, on the, not quite out the water, but at the water's edge. And um, and there were a number of ox peckers and that's sitting on them. And you can see they've obviously been there for quite a while. So the one had some bird droppings on it, all over it, and now it's decided to go back into the water. They've moved off now a little bit further in. Nice and peaceful here at Biffles Hook Dam. Not much else around here at the moment, but always nice to see the hippo. Should we go on the I'm going to move here. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try this side, we might get a better view of them. Let's just go around here. We did hear a pearl spotted owl, and I was trying to see if my whistling could get it to come out. It doesn't look like it, or well, not yet at least, maybe. I'll try, I'll try whistle once more and see if that pool spotted owl comes out for us. That would be nice. Uh, three banded plover just flying past. See, we probably got quite warm in the sun while they were lying outside. Um, like I said, they, they weren't completely out the water, but. Um, but right up in that shallow section against the bank. So most of the body was exposed to the sun so they could warm up. And, um, and then they decided to move back into the water. Laurie Kira, now you asked about the hippo breeding. And if they breed seasonally or all year round. Now, I'm just trying to think. I think with the hippo, 
they generally try have their young um, kind of the in summer when there's a lot of vegetation around for them to feed on as well as the youngsters um, oh, listen But um, but Lori Kira, so it's it's sometimes you know they they try more in the in the summer, but but hippo will give birth any time of year, and they don't have a specific breeding season, like um, like the let's say the impala and the wildebeest, you know they they breed um, or mate rather usually April May, and then they give birth around the same time of year every year. Um, November into December whereas the hippo it's usually in summer because there's more food but they will mate and give birth any time of the year so not specific like those those antelope species Richardson you say you love hippo it's, you know, it's nice to always nice to see them, Richardson. You know what? I've got a lot of respect for hippo because they they can be they can be potentially dangerous if you get too close to the water or if you get between a hippo and the water. Um, up in Botswana, Zambia, when you're on the boats, you've got to be very very careful of the hippo um, because if they do feel threatened, they will they will attack. We know this. They've got huge mouths, very very big teeth, and they can kill people very easily. And they are responsible for more human deaths than most of the animals out here. The hippo and the crocodile, in fact. It's because people get close to water, especially in rural areas. And the hippo and the crocodiles, or the crocodiles see people as food. The hippo, they would just basically defend themselves. So that's why they, um, they attack people if they feel threatened. But So that, like I said, I've just got a, a huge respect for the hippo because they can move very quickly. They are fast faster than you'd expect a big animal like a hippo to move but glad you enjoy seeing them Richardson it's always nice to see some hippo around especially if you're lucky you get them r really basking out of the water on the banks but uh, these ones seem to be a little shy in this area so they hear the vehicles coming they often return back into the water Amazing how still they can sit. Lovely, Laurie. You asked if hippos can see underwater. They can indeed, um, and they do open their eyes and they can see underwater when they do move from one side of the water hole to the other. However, you know the visibility in this water. I wouldn't. I would assume isn't very good, but they do open their eyes and they can see. Um, Hold on a second. Our pearl spotted owl is calling again. Let me see if I can hear where it's coming from. It's in the drainage line. It sounds quite far from us. I'm gonna, let me give one whistle and see if it, if it calls back or if it comes this direction. They are quite territorial sometimes, but maybe my pool spotted owl whistle isn't very good let's try Oh wow! Look at that. There we go. Oh no! Oh yeah! Oh no! So we just had a big yawn by the hip, by the hippo. That's upset that we missed that. I'm sorry. Maybe we get another yawn. Come on. 
<laughs> Henny, you say the hippo's laughing at me? Probably, Henny, probably. Sphinx, you asked, is it true if, that you should lie on the ground if a hippo charges you? Um, Sphinx, I don't know. I've never tested that theory and I probably won't. Um, ew, I don't, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, so I haven't heard of, of that, uh, that theory um, uh, or <laughs> defense against a hippo charge. Look, my my recommendation would be just get out of the way if a hippo charges you. Um, try move if you if you can get away quick enough because they are fast. But don't stick around and test that theory. So if you are wanting to test the lying down theory, I wouldn't. <laughs> Jackie, they do indeed travel at night uh, from, from dam to dam. And the reason for that too is the hippo predominantly feed at night. So they'll move out of the water holes, they'll go into the clearings, and they will start feeding on the long grass. And while they do that, they may indeed move from one water hole to the other if they feel like it, um, or down to the rivers. In fact, they can cover huge distances in, in evenings, especially when it's very dry like it is now, 10 kilometers in a night uh, with with ease they can cover huge distances and they will walk from one water hole to the other yesterday sebastian and i came past Biffleshook dam and we didn't see these hippos so they probably were in another dam not probably definitely they would have been in another dam somewhere Roshni, indeed, well spotted. You can see those very, very deep scars, the battle wounds on that hippo. Now, we know the hippo do get aggressive with one another, and those sharp teeth can cause some serious, ser serious, serious scratches. And you can see that, those marks and scratches and bite marks on the back of that hippo. So it's definitely been in a few fights. But they, they surprisingly, they heal very, very quickly. So... So even though they've got these bad scratches, they do heal quite quickly. Our, our pull spotted owl that I heard has decided not to call back at all. I wasn't impressed with my owl call. I thought it was very good. <laughs> All right, now our pull spotted owl call didn't work, um, and I think I'm going to leave this hippo and see what else we can find. But Taylor's still driving around, and I know she was mentioning she was looking for ostriches the other day, and she was working on an ostrich call. I wonder if she's perfected it yet. <laughs> You talk such nonsense, Byron. <laughs> um, an ostrich call? I don't know if I could do an ostrich call because an ostrich call to me sounds like the beginning of a little of a lion roar. It's a very sort of low bellowing noise. I don't even have the sound on my phone, unfortunately, to play for you. Perhaps we'll have to search for a track, and then I'll let you listen to it. But it's very, very, very soft. It's almost like when you hear the southern ground hornbills calling, you know, it's not very all loud and in your face. It's, you just hear it booming in the distance, and that's exactly what an ostrich call sounds like. So, well, we'll just see how it goes. Now, I, had, unfortunately, have had absolutely no luck. I don't know where all the elephants are going and why they're hiding away from me. And I've checked some of the, their favorite spots, and I could see that they were there at some point today, but they're not there anymore. And I think that those tracks that I had of them and those all of them that crossed out at Baboon Pan maybe they'll be around Chitwa Dam a little bit later uh, so now I think we're gonna go along Gauri Main 
and we'll probably go towards Philemon's cut line and drive the new road but so far no new activity nothing uh, else that has developed between game drives we're at least on this side so maybe it will change if we go to the west we'll get something we just go down here this is also Hosanna's favorite spot but I don't see any sign of him at all come on Rusty Rusty didn't want to go up the hill there so its wheels were starting to spill so I spill, spin so I just thought I'd quickly accelerate to get us up there now this is another spot where the leopards like to lay and I feel as though you could miss them quite easily if you don't look very carefully across the boon pan in the leadwood trees down on the ground and the shady spots so whenever we come through here always make sure we drive past it very 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 slowly because they really could just be sitting there and we could just mince them I don't know what's wrong with my English today it's even worse than normal mince them miss them did we have mince or something recently that I've got it on my mind I can't think so no. oh well let's carry on I would like to do some more birding today but I'm just thinking what I actually would like to see some southern ground hornbills and owls as well tonight I think we'll go on a Scops owl search see this is where the elephants cross if you just look let me turn the car a little bit more for you Craig but if you just look down here on this mitre drain all these tracks here those are elephant footprints going underneath the car so it was an entire herd big ones small ones walking on this very prominent game path and it seems as though they cross out here on a regular basis so this is one of the routes that they like to walk it's not the first time that I've seen all these tracks going through on the same spot so we obviously know leopards and lions mark territory so they have certain routes that they walk the elephants will have favorite pathways too that lead them to water and I think that's exactly it they may maybe they didn't have a drink at Treehouse Dam because that water is not particularly clean um, but maybe they actually just showered themselves with a bit of muddy water to cool off after a hot day and then they might head down towards Chitwa later I don't really know Little Gowry too well and well how many watering holes they have around there where the closest one is because Baboon Pan used to have water in but sadly that's not holding anymore it was a great little pan it brought lots and lots of birds Okay, what else have we got here? This is another good spot that we have to check. The sticks, I'm not sure where the sticks ended up. I know they're just south of our traverse, so we always need to keep an eye out. They could have also done a bit of moving today. Nothing just yet. Mm. I really hope it's not going to be another quiet afternoon. I've had way too many of those now. It's actually a little bit ridiculous. We need cats or elephants or buffalo or any of those things it'd be very nice a pack of wild dogs could quite happily just run in front of my car right now and I'll be ecstatic well, these are all lion tracks from this morning so this is the area where the sticks were sort of playing around up and down on the road in and out of Vuyatela but then their final set of tracks do go south Just check here, just to triple check. <laughs> Riti, you say that I'm so lucky with elephants and you're hoping that we get lucky with some baby elephants. Hmm, I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. I feel, I'm not feeling very lucky today. I thought I was going to be lucky with a zebra. We might have to go and spend the whole afternoon with a zebra at this rate and the few impala that were around there maybe the animals will come to us if we just do that but no I don't know why I'm having this streak of bad luck it happens though out in the bush I promise you you come out and some cycles will just be amazing and see lions, leopards, cheetah all the animals coming out of your ears almost, almost so much that you know my voice will be hoarse after a cycle from talking so much and then other times you'll just go an entire six weeks and have one or two cat sightings it's just how it goes I suppose it's not great, it's not ideal especially when we think that one of those male lines is still on the property somewhere because only two crossed out, we don't know where the third one went 
He gave Ali the slip this, off, uh, this morning and everybody else. No one managed to relocate on him at all. I don't know where he's gone. Now we're just at Shibamo. I haven't driven down here yet this afternoon. I just want to quickly check that. So that there's no one behind me. So that there are no new tracks crossing over. Nothing. Not even a squirrel. <laughs> right, we're going to keep searching. We're going to head towards Philemon's cut line now, then jump onto Mendoza Road and have a little search around there. I'm not sure what Byron's plans are after he visited Bifflesook Dam, but I'm sure he'll tell you. Don't worry, Taylor. Things come to those with patience. I th yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I think the more you you try and look for something out here, the less chance you have of finding it. It's funny how the bush wor works at times. I know in the past I've been looking for animals, specific animals, and we just don't find them. Then when we stop looking for them, they appear. But luckily it's a beautiful afternoon, so it's so pleasant being out here. It doesn't matter if we're not really seeing anything just yet. There's still a lot... Well, there's so much beauty around us, I suppose. A nice warm afternoon sun, the colours. I love these winter colours. Beautiful browns and yellows and greens. It's stunning. Safari Wild Man, you asked if this warm winter weather that we're having is it unseasonal? No, the the winter winter here in this part of South Africa, the northwest northeastern part of South Africa, is very very beautiful. Lovely days, warm, mild, temperate uh, conditions, mid twenties. So that's about um, uh, it's about high seventies or eighty degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and th those are the temperatures that we get in winter around here during the day. The evenings. The evenings do uh, do drop quite a lot, uh, evening temperatures, but uh, it's still, it's not too bad. Not like the rest of South Africa. Some parts of South Africa can get very, very cold. Oh, now this is interesting. I don't know what Taylor's found, but apparently the ghosts of the bush. What is that? The ghosts of the bush, I've actually never heard kudu being referred to them as that, but I'll take it. We've got two, and I suspect that there's a third one around here, because I think they're the same kudu that we saw this morning. We had a very, very quick glimpse of one of them, and we're not too far off from where we had them. And I don't think that it's necessary that, especially the kudu and impala, at the moment, they don't have to travel far distances to find food. Because there's still lots of nice lush leaves on all the trees and that's what they're typically feeding on, especially at this time of the year. We often see them nibbling the new shoots of green grass once the rainy season has fallen upon us, but not, not just yet. We've still got a, a little bit of way to go. I can hear lots of oxpeckers in the distance. And it might be because of the impala. There's lots of impala scattered in between these beautiful kudu. But they are looking so wonderful at the moment. It is very nice to see them. And now the birds are also starting to sing. So the bush is starting to liven up a little bit. Isn't that great? See those beautiful colours amongst the orange and yellows and greens of the bush? Stunning. He's a, he's a boy It looks like he's been around for quite some time. Lovely set of horns. It's so pretty. Just ruminating now. Now, James, you said you also love the winter colours. There's nothing quite like them. It really is the prettiest time of the year in the bush. I always say this. I think all of us say it. Nobody disagrees with that. It's nice to see all the green, of course. And the rainy season of, is, is better to see birds. And that's a fantastic time. And they stand out so nicely against the green vegetation too, especially something like a lilac-breasted roller. Look at that. What are you feeding on a leadwood? Can't actually see what it is he's eating. No, not a leadwood. Spike thorn. Now, Izzy, you say that the horns are beautiful. They are. Look how big those ears are, too. Look at that big nose. Quite a big tongue as well. 
something that you don't often get to see with the animals other than the cats and the giraffe we see them showing their tongues quite often they must have incredibly hard lips as well and if you think about it kudu also like to feed on thorny vegetation so it must be quite tough skin Now, Paula, you're wondering how long can a kudu's horns get? Well, this, this fella here is of medium size. The one that we saw earlier, he's a big boy. Um, I think typically it's just over a meter or so. I'm trying to remember the world record now. You might be able to help me out, but I think it was just shy of one and a half meters. I don't know, I want to say 1.4 something. Maybe someone can pull it up and, and have a look, but it's absolutely massive. Really, really really big especially imagine if when you when you straighten them out how big they'll actually look hey you just photobomb us you see that Craig he just ruined your shot <laughs> coming in like that it looks like he doesn't care though I don't blame him no and also standing behind that leaf does not conceal you oh yes eat it look how gentle they are as well just picking one leaf off at a time not being too greedy and again, just like the giraffe and most of the antelope feed, they don't stay feeding on one tree for a very long time. They're constantly moving with all, all the tannins that are, that are, of course, passing through all of these plants. Isn't that beautiful? It's so peaceful. I can't even hear them moving around. That always just amazes me and some days you forget about it but when you sit in the sighting like this and you realize how quiet these animals have to be and they do they have to stay quiet to survive the noisy animals don't really stay alive for too long unless you're a dominant predator but if you're on the m food menu such as something like a kudu or an impala or a nyala wildebeest zebra you need to make sure that you don't make too much noise right let's go and see what else we can find it sounds like there is a cheetah, sadly not where we can drive, but just north of Cheetah Plains, which is quite cool, I think. Hopefully the Cheetah brothers come back. I don't know when the boys were last seen together. We'll have to actually try and find out about that. So if I bump into any of the Cheetah Plains guides, I shall ask them when last they saw both Cheetah boys together. Anyways, we're going to keep searching as we have been for most of the afternoon and hopefully our luck will change. Let's go and see where Byron is, who he's chatting to, and what animal he's going to show you next. So I'm going to show you a Ninyala next, a cousin of the Kudu that Taylor had, beautiful big male Ninyala. And I say cousin because they do fall under the same family as the Kudu, Tregelephus or Tregelephus, depending on how you pronounce it. And uh, that's the family name for the, um, or the genus name rather, for the for the kudu and the nyala and the bushback. So they are all related. And it's because of those spiral horns and the white markings on the body. And lovely to see these big male inyala. There were three around here. We can't see the other two at the moment. They've moved off into the thicket. But we can see that male luckily still quite clearly. Always nice to see these antelope. I haven't seen some Inyala around for a while. Francis in Israel, uh, there is a big difference between horns and antlers. So, <clears throat> antlers belong to deer and horns belong to antelope. Now the main difference is that the antlers are shed annually, Francis. So that means that obviously they fall off every year and each year they grow new antlers again. Whereas with the antelope, the horns never, uh, or they never lose their horns unless they are broken, but they do not grow back. So the horns actually, for the antelope, they grow throughout their lifespan they are constantly growing. You can see this is quite an old Inyala. See the tips of those horns. You can just see they're very white. That's usually a sign of age. Full grown set of horns. And white tips. The kudu also get those. Um, but if they had to break off, those horns would not grow back. 
So that's the difference between horns and antlers when the antlers will grow back annually. The deer shed their antlers and then grow them back for the mating season. <coughs> Excuse me. Aiden, I don't think these Inyala have a, a favorite type of plant to eat. There might be, oh, there's another one coming to frame. There we go, there's the other one. Um, isn't that beautiful? Now, Aiden, I don't think they've got a specific type of plant that they prefer feeding on. Not that I've seen. I think, uh, I think, um, I mean, at the moment, any bit of green vegetation that they can find. Uh, it looks like they're feeding on a... It looks almost like a young jackalberry. I can't see from it. It's quite far. No, I think I'm wrong. I think it's a bush willow. That is a bush willow that they are feeding on. Sorry, I do apologize. Just looking with my binoculars now, I can see it properly. It's a bush willow. So it depends on the um, on the time of year, which trees have got green vegetation for them to feed on. But I don't think they have a favorite. Not that I've seen seen in Yala feeding on many different types of trees and they are browsers so that means they do prefer feeding on leaves of trees that's what they feed on they don't necessarily feed on grass you might see them with their heads down occasionally feeding but they're most likely feeding on on um, sedges or little shrubs that are sprouting and growing that's what they would feed on but not necessarily the grass so that makes them a browser whereas some of the other antelope species, uh, like the wildebeest, for example, they are grazers, they only eat grass. Uh, Riti, I had a similar question uh, not so long ago about the kudu horns and how heavy they are. Now, I'm not sure how how heavy these um, these horns of the uh, of the Nyala are um, I, I would guess maybe between one and four kilograms probably uh, or one and three kilograms I don't think they're particularly heavy but I'm not sure Riti I don't know I don't know I've never felt a horn on its own so I can't give you an accurate uh, description on how heavy they actually are do you think Seb mm, what, between you. between yeah. one and four kilograms mm, let's say yeah maybe two, three kilograms yeah, yeah two or three kilograms somewhere around there ET I think a big bull maybe a bit more yeah big male probably more the, the sky is Parts of the sky at the moment are just so blue at the moment. I was just having a look around, and if you look through this, there's this beautiful knob thorn next to us. And just through there, the sky is this beautiful blue at the moment, especially with us looking in that direction. The light is perfect. You can see some little flowers on this knob thorn. It's got these beautiful yellow flowers this time of year. Acacia nigrescens, that is the scientific name of the knob thorn. And it's got very prominent knobs that grow on the bark, and that's where the name comes from. But look at those lovely flowers at the moment. And the other, uh, I think it was yesterday I was driving past one that was in full bloom. I could actually smell some of the sweet, uh, or that sweet scent from the flowers. These acacias are quite sweet, often with, uh, or they've got a sweet scent to them. But beautiful blue, blue sky at the moment. See, like I was saying earlier, I think it's so important to to appreciate the surroundings and and nature in general. I mean, with the trees and the the this at this winter basically is so different to summer. So it's nice to enjoy um, and appreciate the surroundings. And like I was saying, you know, with, with Taylor looking for animals, it 
it's often nice if you just take a slow drive and maybe maybe that could be my tip of the day I think is when you're driving around just enjoy the bush and don't be so caught up in having to find something because often when you you've so stressed out about it you don't end up seeing anything but I think if you quite relaxed and just enjoy driving through the bush you'll often bump into things that you didn't expect um, so that's my tip of the day I think what do you think Seb not a bad tip I agree I agree yeah yep. Well, nice to see those in Yala. Let us continue and see what else we can find. Not a bad start. Zebra, uh, Stienbok, the waterbuck in Yala. Nice to see all these antelope species around. <laughs> oh, shame. All right, well, let's head to Taylor, who's apparently still looking for anything. And let's give her some support. Thanks, Byron. That's so sweet of you. <laughs> I can uh, I can feel the sport all the way from wherever you are driving. Hey, seen a couple of impala here and there. I'm looking for one horn shorn. If we're going to look at impala today, we need to find our friend one and a half horn shorn. Sorry, we've just come onto impala plains now. We might have to go and check the guari trees to see how their fruits are, or if their fruits have actually started developing. Last time we checked on them, they were just tiny tiny little things that didn't really resemble a guari fruit at all or yellow I'm just checking very carefully here because I really don't want to miss anything the grass is nice and short in this particular area it's quite nice everywhere else it's still very long obviously the big patches up here so I think the warthogs have been working quite hard and feasting away Craig and I also went past the wildebeest skull uh, that the lions and hyenas had been munching on earlier this morning but sadly nothing I didn't even see the jackals they'd also moved on unless they were lying underneath that shrub in the long grass uh, then I they could have just been in there which is impossible to see them but that skull looked like it was picked clean by something a bird of some sort could have only have done that huh. There's a beautiful line-up. I'm rolling away, sorry Craig, of Inyala. Four. Inyala, isn't that beautiful? Big, small, big, small. All four of them. Their heads down. I don't know, it doesn't look like they're feeding on grass. They're feeding on these little, little shrubs. I'm trying to see exactly what they're eating, but it's a bit difficult to spot it. There's another one coming out. So there must be an entire herd in here. Quite a few youngsters moving around now. Isn't that so sweet? And there's some little bird also just chirping away. Look at this tiny little inyala that's coming out. It's a youngster. It's only a few months old. Stop and have a scratch as well. Also bothered by the flies as you can see. Isn't that nice? You just were looking at inyala with Byron. I think you had the boys though. And now we've got some females. Well, some of these youngsters could be boys. They don't look like they've started developing their horns just yet, so it's a bit difficult to say. I reckon at this one's age, which is probably almost a year old, you would start to see the horns, so that's definitely a girl. I wonder who's chirping like this. I can't think of this bird call right now. It's just sort of happening behind us. Now, I'm hoping we're going to find lots of animals. Oh, here's a nice bull. Let me go forward. So here's the one of the males. I'm sure there'll be a few around here. There we go. Now, Steel Max, you're wondering what is the lifespan of an Inyala? It's fairly sort of similar with most of the antelope species. I wouldn't say more than about, I'd say between 12 and 15 years, somewhere around there. Not particularly old, not living as long as elephants do. He's actually still quite young. He doesn't look like a massive bull just yet. He's He's got a nice set of horns, but I've seen much bigger Nyala bulls in this area. Here are the turtle doves. I'm, see, I have to use all my senses today to try and find animals, not just spotting them with my eyes, but also listening out for any signs. 
Now, John, you're wondering if this, the horns on the Sinyala are solid or hollow. I would say hollow because what happens is you've got a bony protrusion also coming out of the skull and then it's like a, a keratin covering that goes over that bony protrusion and then I'd say a third of the horn is actually is completely hollow. There's nothing inside of it. So it's quite a thin keratin sheath. We'll see if we can, maybe we can make that our mission today. See if we can find an impala or an inyala skull somewhere around there. Something that's still got its horns attached to it. And we can have a look. We might even be able to pull pull the the keratin sort of coverings right off of it. We'll see if we can do that. That could be quite interesting to actually have a look at. Otherwise, we might have to raid the tent. Let me see if I can see these little birds. They are hopping around here. That's the battus making a different call. It's a chin spot battus. Must be doing a little contact call or something. I don't think you'll see them, Craig. It's so so thick in there. Anyways, that's quite interesting because normally they make the three blind mice sort of call. That's how you remember it. And that's a little ch 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 ch. Must just be close contact communication between a male and a female. I did see two of them bouncing about. Right. Who else are we going to find next? Looks like there were a couple of Impala rams at one point pushing each other around. Just from the tracks on the ground. Oh, here's the quarry trees. Oh, they're not growing at all. You can look, look at I just want to very quickly show you, you can show them any of the fruit, this yellow stuff that's starting to develop. On the they're so small still. Oh, it's gonna take even longer than I thought. Oh well. Well, something to look forward to. <laughs> they should be here shortly though. These fruits, I got I cannot wait, of course. I keep telling you about my love for of course the quarry fruits. But we'll keep bumbling about. We're going to go and check around Sydney's dam, see if there's any buffalo or elephants that have come down that way to drink. Maybe some birds. I'm going to send you back across into Mr. Biceps' vehicle. Oh, well, Taylor, good luck. Hopefully you find some animals. Um, I'm going to head down towards Chitra Dam, I think. Um, we had, had some luck there yesterday. We'll see if there's anything else around that area. Spotted a game drive vehicle driving past, taking the guests out on safari. <laughs> Riti. Oh no, so Taylor lined me up for this. She said. <laughs> about the onesie swimsuit story <laughs> uh, so it was actually <laughs> we were sitting around at lunch and we were discussing things and we often go on Instagram and have a look at various posts and that and we saw this post of woman in, and I couldn't think of the name and I said I'm not a fan of these onesie bikinis <laughs> I couldn't think of the name it's just a one-piece costume but I called it a onesie bikini and Taylor thought it was very very funny she said there's no such thing and she mocked me and she's now made me say it live so thank you Taylor for that <laughs> so anyway it's a one-piece costume I, I accidentally called it a onesie bikini <laughs> but maybe that'll stick maybe I can you know, sell it off, patent the term, the onesie bikini. <laughs> I think it's quite a good word. Yeah, I think so too. Seb, thank you. Yeah, you see. We'll take a vote. Who of you think that onesie bikini can stick? <laughs> Maybe we can give it a t as a nickname to Tristan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tristan onesie bikini. <laughs> He's not going to be impressed with that, I don't think. No, no. Oof.
hang on everyone we've found something and just what I was hoping to find yay yay it's elephant now our signal doesn't drop over here if we do lose you don't worry I'm gonna try reposition so we can view them they're just up ahead Hang on a second, I'm going to stop here because I'm just worried if I go any further we might lose signal but there we go, there's a herd of elephant. I wonder if they have been down to the water or if they're planning on going down to the water. That would be great, we're not far from Chitwa Dam. Hey, look at that. We've been lucky with our elephant, eh Seb? Mm, we wanted them. We wanted them, yeah. <laughs> oh, that is really nice. And look at the youngster following the mother. Um, now, the, you see, the thing is with the elephant is they'll move around during the day and they'll cover quite a quite a vast distance of feeding and constantly looking for food. And now in winter, when it is so dry, they'll probably drink quite a quite a few times if they do get to water. We'll probably pass a dam or a river um, probably two or three times a day and drink a little bit and then move on again and feed. There is a very annoying fly that is buzzing around me at the moment. Just hiding, hiding there. There are two of them. Oh, yeah, there are two of them, sure. Two young elephant. Well, I'm not too sure. They look like they're probably around two years old. Maybe just a bit older, two to three years old. This fly is being very annoying at the moment. <laughs> Monique, you say, ah, oh, Ellie's, we can all relax now. <laughs> Found elephant and this is uh, really great to sit and spend time with. I'm hoping they come out into the open. I'm not sure. I might hang around in this area if this fly doesn't drive me wild or crazy. Then I'll stick around and wait, wait for the elephant to come up. What's wrong? I think I'm just getting rid of the flies. Anyway, let's stay calm and enjoy the elephant. <laughs> I'm going to try, see if I can't reposition quickly, um, just to see if we can get a better view of them. But if I, if I lose signal, I'll just um, try and get into a spot where we can see them properly. I'm just going to go over here quickly. We should be okay. I hope. That's a nice view. How's that Seb? Is that good? There we go. I hope you are still with us and I think our signal is okay. The voices in my head tell me it's looking good. Thank you Chantel. <laughs> Hmm. 
nice to see the herd. I'm not too sure how many elephant are here at the moment. Um, let's see if, what I can count, because there were a few I saw moving off. Um, but there's probably at least seven or eight that I can see. And just, but I think there's more. I do think there's a lot more, in fact, further in through the thicket. <clears throat> Lisa, you asked if the elephant's diet changes if they're pregnant. Oh, a beautiful fish eagle call in the distance. Not sure where they are now. It sounded, it didn't sound like it came from the dam. Lisa, getting back to your question, if the elephant's diet changes when they're pregnant, well, um, Lisa, I don't think they get peanut butter cravings or anything at midnight or anything like that. <laughs> no, their their diet won't change, Lisa. They'll still feed on grass and plant material and and the leaves and the bark. They they need just as much nutrients. Uh, or as many nutrients as they can get, so they'll feed on um, just about anything again. Um, but I don't think it, it changes, not from what I've seen. They still feed on the same vegetation they would. There we go, there's a nice view of that one, also out in the open. The young elephant. So this is a nice herd, and generally with the herds, it's the females with the younger elephant. You might have young males with the herd, but um, but the big dominant bulls, they will usually move around by themselves and then meet up with the herd at some point when they're looking to mate, mainly when they're looking to mate. Like with most animals, um, antelope species, like uh, the males will move around in groups and the females in small groups and then when the males are ready to mate they'll go and challenge one another for dominance and the dominant one will be able to mate with the females they'll hang around with the group for a short period of time and then move on again Lovely golden light on that elephant. Now, yesterday's um, Seb and I was sitting watching his elephant, and and um, while we were watching two of them in the water, we didn't realise and one snuck up behind us and flapped its ears and gave us a bit of a fright. So I'm scanning around behind us, but I don't see any others. Um, but it was quite funny. Now, Carolyn, you asked if elephants are territorial. No, they're not, Karen, uh, Carolyn. They're not. Or Caroline. I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. I do apologize if I got it wrong. But um, they... Um, so, Carolyn, they don't... Uh, they're, or they're not territorial. At least elephant will move around and often meet up with elephant from other herds. Um, but they'll cover huge distances looking for food and water. Sometimes they may stick in, in certain areas if they've found a place with lots of food and water. They can hang around, but uh, you know what, we actually might get a better view of these elephant because I see they're starting to move. Hang on, I'm going to reposition quickly. Hello everybody and welcome to the Maasai Mara where on Sunday it's love day for the crocodiles. What a dreadful opening that was. Anyway, it is true. My name is James Henry. That's not me talking to you and that you can see on the screen. That is in fact a crocodile. They are unable to speak English. Hashtag Safari Live. Any questions you have here from the Mara? We are currently looking at the cul-de-sac crossing where there is a crocodile, bull crocodile. Yes, that's what they're called. 
who has been looking somewhere up here. We saw him try earlier to mate with her. A cow crocodile, there she is. Let's just go a little bit to the right. That's her there. How do I know that's her? Well, I don't for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's her because I can't see any other crocodiles in this vicinity. So quite interesting what they were doing uh, is that the bull came up next to her and then sort of put his arm around her, which was quite... ...and sort of put tempted to, well, get a bit closer, as it were, and uh, she was having nothing of it and she disappeared up the river. Now, if you have not watched any of these broadcasts from the crossing cameras before, let me just tell you that we have crossing cameras and additional crossing points on the river where wildebeest and zebra and Thompson's gazelles and topi cross the river to and fro many times during the year and during the migration season. Sorry, this camera has developed a mind of its own. Oh dear. Sorry about that. And this one, particularly, I think, at the early, in the early parts of the season, is a very popular one. I'm sorry about the jerkiness of it. I think there's a little bit of rain in the air that is perhaps causing our troubles. And I'm sorry about the black screens that you're getting every so often. That uh, I, is beyond my understanding, I'm afraid. But I do acknowledge them and apologize profusely for their existence. Then we have two hippopotami. The relationship between hippopotami and crocodile oft debated and oft questioned. And apparently many of you very kindly worrying about my head and whether or not it is recovering. Uh, yes, my, my head is recovering. Cord, and I did indeed lose it, but my eye also mercifully is much less sore and... Uh, the vision is clear, so that's good. Thank you very much for your concern. Tamus. Now this hippopoptamus tends to spend most of its time here, actually, quite interestingly, and I have mistaken him. In fact, a hippo. Yeah, I mean, they just spend their days sitting in the stream and then when things get going with the crossings, it's interesting, they move towards the crossings and they kind of get in amongst the animals that are going across the river. They don't tend to snap at them. Often they can be found around about a kill site. Uh, whether they are fighting with crocodiles or whether they are eating from the carcasses, I'm not really sure. All righty, now a few days ago, Byron was on bushwalk and he said that I lost a fight with a piece of string, which I thought was very unkind of him. And I would like you to go back to him now and tell him that I think he is very unkind indeed. Oh, James, I do apologize. James has been quite sensitive about the battle with the string or the bungee cord. Uh, if only James was here, I would give him a hug and let him know that it's all going to be okay. <laughs> now, this herd is moving. Hold on a second. I just want to try reposition again quickly. I don't think we'll lose signal. Yeah, they're moving out into the open. Give a wonderful view of the whole herd. Oh, there we go. That's what we wanted. You alright there, Seb? Oh, look at that. Beautiful big female here. Tracy, you asked if the elephant can have twins. They can indeed, Tracy. Um, they, they, they can have twins. It has been documented before in the wild. I've never seen twins, but, um, but yes, apparently the elephant can have twins. 
Isn't that wonderful, beautiful golden light with these elephant? Oh, they're moving quite quickly. Oh, there's a road not far from us. Jan Eric, and you're a new viewer. Hello to Jan. I um, hope you are enjoying Safari Live and great to have you with us. You asked how long can elephants go without water. Now, Jan, in parts of, um, of Africa, it can get very dry. And I know elephants have been, uh, they can move through areas uh, for uh, quite some time without actually finding water. But, but ideally, they don't want to wait that long. Hold on, I'm just going to wait. This one's probably going to move quite close to us. Wonderful. 